Hi everyone, it's noon and we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today um, and welcome to the first day of breakout sessions of the virtual Iowa Governor's Conference on Public Health. As you know, we usually meet in person every April to share best practices and lessons learned, um, but like everyone else, Corona has caused us to pivot um, and we're doing so without forgoing our commitment to learning and, and growing. Um, we're so excited that you've decided to spend time with us today learning from our own public health experts around the state. My name is Lena Tucker Reinders and I'm the Executive Director of Iowa Public Health Association. I'm grateful you have joined us today and hope you'll continue to meet with us daily to support our, our public health colleagues as they present their work to you. The Governor's Conference is put on every year by Iowa Public Health Association and Iowa Environmental Health Association. Um, I encourage you to join Iowa Public Health, your, I encourage you to join your public health colleagues as a member of Iowa Public Health Association um, and or um, Iowa Environmental Health Association as well. Um, the IPHA's mission is to unite and strengthen the voice for public health in Iowa, which is exactly what we're doing today. So um, like I said, I encourage you to join our association um, and take advantage of all that we have to offer. I also want to thank the sponsors and exhibitors of the virtual conference, the virtual governor's conference. Um, their commitment to public health in Iowa is paramount, especially in these times. Uh, the sponsors of the virtual conference are Aetna, Amerigroup, Unity Point Health, and the University of Iowa College of Public Health. You will find a list of virtual exhibitors on the governor's conference website at iowapha.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, um, both of our today's speakers, I just want to remind everyone that remind everyone that you are on mute and the chat function has been um, been selected so that you can only correspond with panelists. Um, this will help us ward off any Zoom bombers that might be out there. At the end of each presentation, there'll be time for Q, for questions. Um, if you have if you're not familiar with Zoom um, and how that works, you can see at the bottom of your screen here the Q&A button that I've circled um, and use that and type in your question and I will read them to the presenters um, and they can ask, they can answer them at the end of each one of their presentations. So um, to, uh, a note on CEUs, um, a note on CEUs that the second presentation that we have today from um, Jackie Kernick is available for CEUs for, for dietetics and um, Chez. And so to receive those credits, you'll need to type your name and the credits you want in the chat function. I will keep track of that and be in touch with you directly. Okay, so now onto our first presenter. Uh, Maria Schrack is an MPH student at DMU at Des Moines University, and she'll be discussing her work to evaluate a peer education program among, among random people living with HIV. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mariah. Hi everyone, thank you Lena for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to share, let me get my slides, my program evaluation with a nonprofit in Rwanda called Rwanda Network of People Living with HIV. A little bit of background to get us started, um, just the rationale for this research done in Rwanda was estimates suggest that there are 60 million people infected with HIV, with 25 million that have died. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa has also been the most afflicted by HIV and AIDS, both in terms of mortality and morbidity. And in 2015, that region accounted for 70% of people living with HIV as well. Uh, I also wanted to focus on the youth people living with HIV. And so youth compromised 40% of new HIV infections. And when looking specifically at Rwandan youth, they have a comprehensive HIV knowledge of 50%. Um, the 1994 genocide in Rwanda was also a pivotal event in Rwanda's history that caused HIV incidence to spike at its highest that the country has seen. During this time, around 2,000 to 5,000 Rwandan children were born to women that were raped during the genocide. And in present day Rwanda, they have completed two of the three 90-90 targets. So they're moving on to um, trying to accomplish the 95-95-95 targets. So the rationale for that was to evaluate the nonprofit called Rwanda Network of People Living with HIV, which works with um, people living with HIV, both affected and infected with it, and their families, and really to help them increase their program capacity so they can achieve the 95, 95, 95 targets. 
My evaluation questions were what provinces are statistically significant in the change of unstable and stable cases in Rwanda between October 2018 and September 2019? What are the peer educator patient caseloads between these two time periods? What are the challenges being reported by peer educators and what unique findings are reported by province? The methodology was collaborating with my preceptor at Rwanda Network of People Living with HIV and determining what evaluation they wanted me to do, what would really help them and benefit their organization as a whole. And so I decided on a secondary data analysis using mixed methods. I used the CDC data from October 2018 to September 2019, and then the quarterly peer educator reports, which each um, province and geographical region has peer educators assigned, which they go out and visit the people living with HIV and they really finalize reports and to see how things are going to give a better perspective. Um, both of the data I used to analyze the quantitative was the SPSS and max QDA for the qualitative. My measures were the sum of stable and unstable cases between the two time periods, quarter one and quarter four. I defined patients as unstable if they had greater than 200 viral load copies and stable if they had less than 200 viral load copies. And then the peer educator participant caseloads between the two time periods, as well as the quarterly peer educator reports that presented the challenges as my qualitative data. And to guide my qualitative data, I used the social ecological model because I really thought that this helps improve the understanding of personal and environmental factors and how they influence the health issue as there's not usually one challenge in HIV care. This is my social ecological model and how I defined it. I'll go into the details in the next slides, but I chose the individual, interpersonal, organizational, community, and public policy levels. Will, uh, Jackie will talk about boosting environmental health literacy. Um, and again, this session has been approved for CHES and dietetic CEUs. If you're interested in those credits in particular, um, please take your, type your name and the type of credit into, this, um, into the chat box and I will follow up with you directly. Um, for those of you who are inquiring about nursing CEUs, um, there are a, a few, um, four sessions plus the keynote that have been pre-approved for nursing CEUs, and we're still working on the rest of those. Um, Jackie's session coming up has been approved for CHES and dietetics. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jackie. Thank you, and thanks for that great um, presentation, Mariah. I actually um, went to Rwanda when I was an undergrad, and so I, you had a lot of great insights that um, I kind of connected to. So um, my session today will be on, you guys can see my slides and everything. Um, my session will be on scientific communication approaches to improve environmental health literacy, but uh, I would say it's more just general health literacy, um, general communication approaches. So um, as you might know, I planned this session before the coronavirus pandemic hit our country. And so I tried to kind of updated a little bit, but I think that it'll be very relevant uh, given what we're learning about um, with the pandemic. So um, about me, I have a master's of sustainable development practice from the University of Florida, and I focused on environmental communication uh, when I was there. And I, for my graduate work, I actually made a documentary film about um, environmental justice uh, in St. Lawrence Island, Alaska, which is an island that has um, indigenous communities, a, a native Alaskan community, and they've had a lot of contamination from a military site that was there. And so um, it, the film's called Pulling Teeth from a Polar Bear, but that's kind of my background. And then I brought that to the University of Iowa where I do events such as Science Cafe, uh, but I also make videos that are related to different topics that our center is trying to work on. So um, I think in the last couple of weeks, the last month, we all have gotten a lot of health communications. And so we should be pretty familiar with this. Um, health communications is basically you know, ways of communicating, whether that is promotional information, a targeted public health campaign, a longer educational program, 
or even a care provider and a patient and their relationship. So those communications can either, you know, do several things, seek to increase knowledge and awareness about an issue, influence behavior and attitudes, advocate for a position or an issue, um, policy issue, uh, seek to support and use health services, kind of like what Mariah was talking about in her presentation, and then I'll also argue against uh, misconceptions and false information. So I can't think of anything more relevant right now. I would like to say that when we're designing a communication topic, it's important to you know not um, try to do all of these things in one go. There's kind of only if you're going to be effective, you want to have targeted communications, and so you wouldn't necessarily try to influence their behaviors and attitudes at the same time as talking about a policy. Um, well, I mean, you might, but it might not be as effective. So really thinking about what goal you're trying to have. So um, health literacy is just the idea that if a person is able to obtain, process, and understand health information, um, and then make their health decisions based on that, they have health literacy. And environmental health literacy is sort of just the extension of that. It's a subdiscipline where we're communicating environmental and risk communication. Uh, it, traditionally, I would say that that was environmental contamination or maybe um, pollution, cancer clusters that might have been environmentally influenced. Uh, but now, during you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, we can also, you know, talk about this uh, with health literacy, but environmental health literacy, too, in that people that are already at risk for environmental health problems, such as pollution or respiratory issues, uh, they're actually more likely to, you know, suffer um, and have negative outcomes from COVID-19. So our center that I work at the University of Iowa is, uh, an, is funded by the NIEHS, which is the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And they were one of the people that really, or one of the groups that really started this field in the 1990s. So uh, I, as I said, I use a lot of multimedia approaches. I work primarily in video and um, photography, but there's lots of different ways that we can share information. So, you know, now more than ever, media is a very critical tool and it is designed so that we can work together, we can have advocacy, action, and then hopefully change because of that. And so we might think of traditional journalism as part of this, um, as well as video, photography, podcasts, social media, um, uh, published papers and, and books. So when we think about it, networks of solidarity are really important. And maybe before the COVID-19 pandemic, I would have maybe talked about um, different indigenous groups throughout the, um, throughout maybe the Arctic that are experiencing similar challenges that are related to climate change, uh, contamination, because contamination actually is more uh, pronounced in the Arctic because contaminants move there. Um, and so maybe these groups that are experiencing similar issues might share their stories together and using social media or other forms of kind of digital communication, they will have um, those networks. But now with COVID-19, I feel like our entire world is a network of solidarity. We are constantly seeing stories from all over the world and people that are really experiencing the exact same thing um, obviously with different outcomes and different challenges in each context, but uh, we as a world are a network of so solidarity. Something else to consider is participatory storytelling, and so I like to explain this as um, maybe in traditional journalism, you might have a journalist come in, interview a couple people, and then leave and write their story based on their, their version of the truth. But participatory storytelling involves us as people that are affected by an issue or a project or a program actually involved in that storytelling. And so that might mean we give cameras or equipment to students and they come up with their own projects or we really take into account the community's concerns and the community's um, you know, messaging and their hope for the story when we're creating it. And so it really involves a lot of communication, a lot of back and forth, and it takes a bit longer, but that way you have something that 
you really feel is reflective of community values. And then also, you know, audience specific information is important. So thinking about who are we talking to and what kind of information is appropriate to them. We're not going to give the same information to healthcare workers that we are to uh, the public, not necessarily because we're trying to hide anything, but maybe the language that we're using is inappropriate or the messages might be confusing. And so we're always really thinking about who is the target audience. Um, and as I had said about COVID-19, in this time, um, you know, you might want to think about sharing your stories. And so that might be, what is your organization doing to prepare and respond to this uh, crisis? Or, you know, highlighting the work of specific individuals, such as researchers, healthcare workers, essential workers, anybody. Um, and then I think that just a, a tip would be to follow people over time. I think that will provide interesting um, information and context. And so if you're thinking about um, your organization and what you guys are doing, you might want to start documenting now, even document what had happened in the last couple weeks, and then follow those same individuals or that same theme for a, you know, the next several months. And I think that would provide a lot of um, ability to shape the story. And we'll talk about story, story shape in a little bit. And as we are doing this remotely, everything is harder and easier in some ways because we're always recording ourselves now. So that's uh, a benefit. But um, you know, you can have people film and record themselves and submit to you. Um, now might be a good time to learn about things like um, technical skills such as editing. If somebody on your staff or in your office um, is interested in you know, starting video production, this would be a really good time to edit and learn that because it's basically just watching YouTube videos and playing around. And then also Zoom, you know, we are using it now and there's the ability to record uh, like what we're doing now or just record maybe audio and thinking about podcasts. Uh, podcasts are a pretty easy, somewhat easy format to, to start out with and people are consuming that information like crazy. Um, and so what makes a good story and a good science story is that? Um, a story is not static. It progresses over time. It has highs and lows. Um, maybe there's emotions attached to it. And when we think about it, we want to know what is at stake in your science? This isn't necessarily a summary of what your science is. It's why is that science important? And Sometimes that can be a little bit removed from what you're doing. Um, I know, I mean, I'm not a, a trained scientist myself, but when I talk to my colleagues, they might be working on a specific part of an experiment, and it's so specific that it's really hard for someone outside of that world to understand why it matters. And so really trying to bring it to a larger perspective of what is the overall goal? How could the world or the health um, outcome be changed because of this element of your science. And then also thinking about scientific language versus story language, uh, what words are, you know, scientific words versus uh, someone that a general audience might understand, uh, or even more emotional words. Oh, and I added audience late today, and so I spelled it wrong, but uh, thinking about your audience again. So um, here's a quote that I had included, which says, storytelling includes a creative element. It requires a certain level of vulnerability. As neither of these are emphasized in scientific training, scientists are typically taught to take themselves out of their work and remain as objective as possible. It's not surprising that this part of the learning process can be challenging. And so I think for me, that's why it's helpful in that I'm trained more from a social science perspective, from a storytelling perspective, and then working with scientists to, you know, or practitioners or whoever to really understand, um, you know, why they're interested in this work or what is important about this work. It can create a nice balance. So there are three, these are three kind of stories that you could think of when you're thinking about I want to share a story with the world. And this might mean you're writing a piece, you could be making a podcast, a video, um, you could even do a poster or a drawing, uh, whatever you're conveying, you know, you can kind of think of these ideas. 
So you have the story of self, and that might be a focus on a scientist or a person, and, and why have they been called to do this work? It'll speak to your life experiences and the choices that you made. Uh, it might be about you know pain and struggle and why that is important to you. So um, maybe you had experience with losing a loved one and they might have passed away of an illness. And that might be a reason that you work in that specific area or your family um, had dealt with environmental contamination, which is kind of some of the work I do. And now people are environmental advocates. And so that's more of yourself as a story. And it, it puts um, the science in there, but that's not always the main focus. And then there's a story of us. Uh, so remember a time when we had COVID-19, had a pandemic. Um, and so it's kind of an experience of our whole community. Um, and it helps us sort of it, as it says, have core values and recognize what our core values are as a, a group. And I think that would be very relevant to the story of your organization. What did this county or this group do uh, during this time? Or, you know, even thinking beyond um, our pandemic, thinking about what kind of program did you did you guys put on? This could be, you know, if you had a a workshop for healthcare workers telling that story. Remember a time when we did this. And then a story of now, um, it kind of enca encapsulates all of this. Um, it's especially for COVID-19. It's the urgent challenges that our community faces and that we're called upon to action. And so um, the hope that we can face them successfully as well as the choices that we must um, make to act. So this often is a very public narrative. It's kind of a conversation that we might be having at the national level. Um, and so these are uh, shapes of a story. And so when I'll, on the next slide, it'll have a little diagram about the shape, but um, some other ways to think about it are discovery. So this will be if you're working on an HIV vaccine or you're working on some cutting edge research and you're just sort of following along what that takes and it's usually not a um, linear trajectory so the scientists the people that are working on this issue they're usually the central characters but then it can you know show us the successes and failures of uh, going through that process and then rescue is a different shape of a story um, Maybe we're starting at the beginning of, say, HIV again. Um, we might start at a high point. We just got funding and things are going great. And so we're starting at the high point of their fortune, but then there might be a loss um, followed by something that happens that is positive at the end. And I bring these up to show that there should be some sort of movement. And that's why it's important to capture things as they go. Um, if you watch documentaries or, you know, other stories, they take place over time and so you can naturally capture the good and the bad. So these are kind of the examples of the shape I was talking to you about. Um, on the, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but here at the bottom we have despair and then at the top we have prosperity and so our lives and our journeys kind of fluctuate between these. And so when you're taking a story or footage or whatever, m thinking about moving through and thinking about an arc um, can just make for a more dynamic story. This is basically what I described, but maybe something that you saw in like um, grade school. This is maybe how you would write a story. And so I had this as a printout for when we were going to do the session in person at the conference. And at the bottom, you see a bit.ly link. And so I've created, I put some of these online in case you wanted to use them for your students. I imagined, or, you know, whoever you're working with, I imagine this as to be like a workshop. So if you were thinking about your own um, experience or a story that you wanted to tell, um, how might you lay it out? And so we have the introduction, uh, you're introducing the characters, you're, you're explaining the science and the information. And then you might find a conflict or a climax, either something really good or something really bad happens. And then the characters deal with that and then you resolve it. 
So um, if you follow this bit.ly link at some point, you can download this. It's, it's pretty simple, but it could be a fun activity to do um, with any populations that you work with. And if you go to this link, it is at the bottom. We have a bunch of videos and stuff on our website, but at the bottom uh, menu, it'll say like IGPH resources. So um, this is a video, but I won't show the video for sake of time. Um, but it is a video that I made for the EHSRC and it's about wind energy. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this because it kind of involves some of the concepts I just discussed, which is uh, we started making this video with our stakeholders at the Iowa uh, Law and Policy Center, as well as the Iowa Environmental Council. And it came because we were talking to people about some of the challenges they were facing. And one issue was uh, wind energy and there being some false misconception, false things that people were saying about um, wind energy being dangerous to your health. And so because of that, we decided to make a series of videos that kind of highlight wind energy in Iowa. And so it was about an eight minute video that we put into three smaller videos that are like two and a half minutes each. And they discuss uh, first the history of wind energy in Iowa, why it's important, why we have, you know, why it's so important to our economy. And it kind of lays the groundwork for, hey, this is something that we care about that we want to continue to support in Iowa. And then we also uh, said that there are, it is a, a threat. Um, there are some people that are usually not from Iowa originally, actually, they're coming from out of state. They're trying to stifle our wind energy um, industry in the state. And so we bring that as sort of maybe a conflict, showing you why it's important that we still have support for this. And then we also use the video to talk about the actual health information that we have. So we interviewed the scientists at our center, at the EHSRC, and they summarize their findings, which is that there wasn't any sort of negative health outcomes from using wind energy. Uh, we talked about the studies that were done. There was a little bit of annoyance that people had. Um, so sometimes people were annoyed if, the, if a wind farm was in their area, but that usually was because they hadn't been properly consulted or talked to. So, um, and you can probably find, you can find the videos on our website actually on that same bit.ly link, but um, it was a good way to kind of convey scientific information. And I'll explain a little bit on how I did, how I put that together. So um, when I am starting out and I'm trying to tell a story, the first things that I usually do is brainstorm what I want to know about the topic. So I will have community uh, conversations with community members. In this case, I talked to our stakeholders um, in those organizations and figured out who wants to be interviewed, but also just what the general themes are. Usually a storyteller like myself, you know, I don't work in wind energy all day. I have some fluency in it, but my main skill is that I'm able to talk to people and able to understand a picture. And so you have to be very, um, you know, curious and I think it's sometimes good to have that as you know you're not necessarily telling the story of your own work because you get a little bit more separated from it and you see a lay person's view maybe a question that would be very obvious to to you um, isn't obvious to someone like me because I don't work in that field all day so you might want to generate a list of important topics and messages that you want to convey and then I usually break that up. So I might say, okay, here's a bunch of questions about the economics of it. Here is some questions about health. Here are some about um, the resistance and, and what, is, what is the real story behind that? And I break them up and then I ask maybe uh, open-ended questions among each topic. And, you know, they're not necessarily, sometimes I just have quotes or I just say, can you tell me more about um, this this one person or this one experience and kind of let the, the um, interviewee talk and re react. And then I wanted to make a note about finding balance. There is a, a lot of times that we're told that we have to tell both sides of the story. And I don't 
and we want to have factual information. And sometimes there isn't necessarily another side. There might be a different perspective, but facts are facts and science is science. And so don't necessarily feel the need to just oppose it just to, to be balanced. And so um, I think that that's an important aspect of that. So for video production, I want to say that I know that most people on this call right now are like, I probably can't do this. I don't know how to, to make a video. It's irrelevant to me, um, but it really isn't as hard as you think. And if you have someone in your group or organization that you think might be up to this um, challenge, I think it's a very awesome skill to have. And it really allows you as a group to put information out there without having to pay a lot of money to have things done. So this is a picture of uh, my documentary kit that I had um, for, my, for my film, and I, I made an 18-minute documentary with this. So you'll see a laptop, um, that is a DSLR camera, uh, it, you know, a video DSLR. We had some lapel microphones, which are microphones you clip onto your shirt. Um, there's a zoom recorder actually it's the little black uh, recorder kind of near the muff and it's called zoom but it has no connection to this zoom and so that's like a $99 recorder but it has good quality sound and so things like that you could um, invest in and maybe get a kit for I don't know $500 or something like that but you'd really be able to use it and get your money's worth so there are uh, three kind of sections of video production. You have your pre-production, which is your planning and your setting up, your production, which is we are filming, we are gathering our footage, and that could be for a podcast too, you know, we're recording, and then post-production, which is editing. And it requires uh, several skill sets. It requires you to be administrative and set up, you know, the appointments to talk to people, as well as creative, social, and, and business as well. And in order to do it correctly or participatory, you want to have a lot of conversations with the community. So when I made that wind energy video, I had many conversations, well, not many, but I had maybe two or three conversations before I filmed. I filmed, I, didn't, I did a rough cut, and then I sent it back to um, our stakeholders got their thoughts on it, made some changes. And so that way it's just more reflective. And if I miss something or if something was not relevant, then it's you know able to do that. And I would say the shorter, the better. It, and that's difficult sometimes, but for social media, if you can make a video under two minutes, that is awesome. If maybe you, are submitting something to a festival or you're doing it for a class you know maybe it can be a bit longer but our attention span as as a human race is rapidly declining unfortunately and so i have a handout that is also on the bitly link which i'll show you this is part of it um, and i don't want to go through all of it right now because i know it's a lot of information but these are just kind of things that you could think about if you wanted to get started and i really think now is such a great time to try this because you could even have a zoom meeting and record that and, and play around or you can use your iphone or if you have a video camera um, you know you can start to play around with it so some things to think about though are, are media releases if you're recording people that maybe you don't work with I mean, you want to get a media release just generally. So asking people, is it okay to be filmed? Um, you know, here's what we're going to do with that. Sometimes they can sign it. And um, so then for production, as I said, we have interviews, but also something else to think about is B-roll. So what kind of pictures can you have? What kind of other shots can you acquire so that it's easier to edit? Um, you might use music or you might use just some background audio of um, a cornfield if you're talking about rural agriculture or something like that. But you wanna kind of think about those in advance uh, so that you have all of your media there while you're in production phase. And then for post-production, I said media management, which means you wanna have a system for saving your information. So if you record something on a camera or on a recorder, 
uh, make sure you have a, a place that you keep everything, that you have um, them organized maybe by date or by topic, and maybe you back them up on a cloud or you get an external hard drive, those kinds of things. And I would say that um, the analysis of like a documentary or a podcast, it's very similar to what maybe academics would do when they're just um, studying research. You're trying to find common themes. Um, you're trying to maybe group things together in a way that makes sense. And so that's a lot of why I talked about scenes and arc and um, pacing. Uh, pacing, you know, maybe means that you're not giving a, a ton of information at once. You're kind of providing some information and then maybe you have a scene of just the cornfields so that people can kind of digest it. And then you might have an emotional scene after that. And it, it means that it just allows things to ebb and flow. I use narration. I don't use it a, a lot, but almost in every video, I might make a cut together and say, okay, what other information is missing that the audience might need to know before they start watching this video? So it's usually a short introduction. You know, here I am talking about Iowa wind and why it's important. And so we talked to these three people and so listen now. And it just kind of gives the audience um, a bit more information. So this is the second part of the handout. Uh, this is my full uh, hit list of the things that I use. Um, I got this on like a student budget. So really not a ton of, um, it, it wasn't too expensive and you don't need everything, but so this is kind of, can get you started. And then uh, my last little section is about an event that we planned at the EHSRC. And it's kind of, you know, it's not about videos, it's about uh, working with journalists. I think that it's really important now for journalists to be able to cover the information correctly, um, you know, health information. And so we had this event in um, 2019, last March, and it was basically just to create a network and encourage excitement about environmental journalism in the state of Iowa. So we brought together um, about 31 participants and 15 speakers of journalists and academics and uh, students and even a couple community members to just talk about certain issues. And the goal was that they would be able, the people who experience the training would be able to be connected with experts. So if they ever had questions, they'd be able to um, ask people questions. And then they'd also feel a little bit more confident in their environmental reporting skills. They might have a basis of knowledge of something that they, um, you know, might not know too much about, but now they feel a little bit more confident to start reporting on it. And then also just giving them um, information to show how important the work that we do is. So it's a little bit of PR, but um, I think it provides useful information. So um, our agenda for that event was, um, we had an activity, which I was going to do at our live session of telling our environmental story. Uh, every time I do a session, I like to do something interactive at the beginning. So for that, it was basically people would draw with crayons on a piece of paper their environment when they grew up. What was nature to you? And so I'm from Florida. And so, you know, I drew the beaches and manatees and other people drew um, prairie and cornfields. And, uh, and then we wrote a little hundred word story about that. And that's using their creativity. So then we, and then we had a science and media panel in which we invited um, mostly journalists that had covered a lot of science to come and talk and talk about the challenges. Uh, we had a hot topics session. So depending on, you know, what is important to you, uh, maybe if your organization were to do something like this, you'd want to talk about the work that you've done around COVID-19 or the work that you've done around radon or, or whatever it is. Um, is basically your opportunity to provide scientific information to set the record straight about any issue. We also provided some um, reading material so we could talk about that. Uh, we covered nitrates. That was one of the hot topics that people really wanted to know about. So we had uh, three nitrate experts. Um, and then we did some systems thinking exercises, kind of thinking holistically, as well as um, a highlight from a local high schooler and um, her dad that had worked on a, an environmental communication project. 
I will say all of these videos are also on our website from that link. And we recorded some of our sessions um, as a way to, you know, make it a living experience. So if you wanted to know about nitrates, you can go and watch that video and watch the panel. We also um, had it on the record. So the reporters could write a story and use the quotes from that um, session so that they could, you know, boost that in their reporting. It also is just a great way to get your name out there. It, it, the event wasn't um, too expensive since we had it at a library and it was just one day. Um, and so it was kind of a way to build relationships. Um, and so I have a, on that resources page, as I had said, this is kind of a guide to creating something like this. It's basically an event planning kind of timeline. So telling you what kinds of things you might do um, month by month to do that. So check it out if you're interested. And then uh, that's it for me, so thank you. Thanks, Jackie. I think that um, it was so interesting and uh, with some of the comments coming in, people are talking about how they're just starting to explore this. So it's a very timely topic. Um, and it's a good reminder for me that I will be getting you and Mariah media releases before I publish this video on, on YouTube. Um, so thanks for that reminder. Um, uh, let's, if, as questions are coming in, I'll start off with one of um, my own. Um, as you may know, we are working with immunizations and immunization and education advocacy. And so your, your comment about kind of the, the balance, story balance was um, particularly relevant to some of this. Um, and we're, we often see an, um, journalists uh, trying to create the balance where there maybe isn't any, where, you know, talking about a debate where there is no debate. And I know that that's true in environmental work as well. And so would you recommend calling that out and doing some myth busting or just, just keeping to the facts and the science and leaving the false narrative out completely? Yeah, we, that's a, a great question. We've talked about that before, actually. We talked about that um, in the wind video because it was, should we address the cancer issue head on? Should we, should we say it does not cause cancer? Um, because on one hand, if you, if you kind of give light to the myth, maybe it's people hear it more. And there is some um, evidence to say that when people hear things, it, even if they know it's not true, the more they hear it, the more they think it might be true. Um, I would, that immunizations is a really tough one, I would say, but I would, I would say to keep the, you know, focus on the facts. And some of those facts are that there are, there is no evidence that vaccines cause autism and that the person that put that out there has you know been debunked and, and so I think that is part of the factual information but especially if you're talking to a journalist I would maybe if it's you say off the record or something just say it is dangerous to continue to show the other side when it has been so much disproven and so I think calling it out to the journalist in particular um, would, would be fine. Great, that's helpful, and I think it's it's relevant for so many areas that we work in. Um, let's see. Um, well, I don't see any other questions coming in. So, if you have any final thoughts you want to leave us with, um, actually, there's yeah. requests for slides. Or is it possible to make slides available outside of the 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 presentation? Yeah, yeah, I can send the slides, and I understand that you know this was supposed to be about, I think, an hour or so. So it is a lot of information that maybe people, um, you know, aren't, haven't digested yet. But um, I'll have the slides in my email as well if, you, if anyone has any questions. I think that this is uh, definitely a relevant topic for, you know, everyone trying to share their story right now. Um, and all we have really is the internet to do that. Great. Um, one, actually, one more question um, come in. What, um, what type of editing, um, what's an easy to learn editing package for something like a Zoom meeting? Um, yeah, so that, thank you for that question. I should have talked about that a little bit. I personally have used Final Cut Pro X, which is Final Cut Pro 10, and that's mostly a Mac program. So if you work on Macs, um, that might be a good program to invest in. But there's also iMovie that comes with a Mac for free. 
But with um, Zoom specifically, because those a lot of the editing software, including Final Cut, is more designed so that you could put like several clips together and you know do more sophisticated things, you might not need that for a Zoom meeting. And you can actually edit inside of YouTube now. So you just upload your video to YouTube and say you wanted to cut out the first part where we're doing introductions or whatever, you can just literally trim it inside of the YouTube editor and that way um, it's, it's easy and you don't have to buy another program. Great. Um, we have one more comment, more of a comment, but I think it reflects all of our sentiments. Um, the, we have somebody who's a PIO for their local public health department, and um, she's saying that your advice is extremely relevant right now. So um, I'll Thank echo you. that as we close. And I think both you, Jackie and Mariah, um, for presenting your work today, especially thank you both for being the first people on our webinars um, to, for volunteering to go first. <laughs> we had a lot of people volunteer to be last, so um, I'm grateful that you're volunteering to be first. Um, both of your work is inspiring, and I mean, it, it, from, represents different different ends of a, the spectrum and of the globe, but it's all relevant here to us in Iowa. And it's something that, that you've given us something to think about and, and how we can apply to our own work. So um, thank you again. Um, I'm gonna highlight just our next, um, to, we, as, as I said in the beginning, we are doing this every day. Um, uh, so I hope you will come back and join us tomorrow. Uh, there we go. Um, tomorrow, actually not tomorrow, on Friday, um, when we have Olivia Masterson and Ed Bataille speaking about their subjects. Um, tomorrow is actually the Iowa, Iowa Public Health Association's uh, monthly third Thursday lunch and learn. And so we won't be having the governor's conference virtual session tomorrow. We'll be having our lunch and learn instead. And for that topic, we'll be just, I'll be discussing um, rate, the racial disparities that are being highlighted by COVID-19 um, here in Iowa and around the country. And I'll be talking with Mich Dr. Michelle Devlin from University of Northern Iowa. So I encourage you all to log on to that. You can find that um, information on our Facebook page um, as an event. Um, and then join us back here on Friday for our next breakout sessions um, uh, of the Virtual Iowa Governors Conference on Public Health. So um, again, we are social distancing, but we are doing so together. We're a network um, and we're colleagues that are dedicated to public health in Iowa. So I thank you for joining us. Um, have a great day. Thank you.